Welcome back. Last time we discussed the central doctrine of Ishraqi thought, the ontology of light and the equation between knowing and being. Now we want to return to the distinction between reason and the intellect, its role in our return to the world of lights, and conclude with how the equation between knowledge and being relates to God's knowledge of particulars. Returning to the distinction between reason and the intellect, Sohrawardi says that there are two types of knowing. That is, a way of knowing in which we know through concepts, which is practically all we learn before, during, and after college, and another he and the Sufis call tasted knowledge. Just examine all that you've learned in college during the day. The knowledge of physics, of astronomy, of modern philosophy, of logic, of history, and so forth, is all based on concepts. But there's another way of knowing. Suppose you ate a very wonderful meal at night. Or worse than that, you ate a very bad meal and were kept up all night vomiting. Now, that's another kind of knowledge. The knowledge that you had of a stomach ache did not come to you through a concept. It was direct knowledge. Or if someone were to take a needle right now and prick it into your skin, you would not say, ouch, after considering several concepts in your mind. Concepts would have no role to play. It would be an immediate experience. Now, for ordinary human beings, immediate knowledge only remains on the level of the senses, of sensations. The possibility of immediate knowledge on the intellectual plane is very rare among us. The reason the sages call that tasted knowledge is precisely because it corresponds to tasting. If you take candy and put it in your mouth and it's sweet, the knowledge of that sweetness is immediate knowledge. It's not based on a concept. This is the distinction between reason and the intellect. The latter is concrete, but for higher levels of reality. And reason needs data or input either from the senses, the intellect, or revelation as its starting point to operate, and is not independent of these. Now, this being the case, Sohrawardi says we have to be able to take the immediacy of this experience that we have most of us only on the physical plane and transform it to the intellectual plane. It's very difficult. And to do that, we have to not only train the mind and cultivate our mental faculties, we also have to cultivate our possibility for receptivity. That is, purify ourselves to receive the ishraq, the illumination. And this is where the doctrine of ishraq separates itself from forms of fideist mysticism or love mysticism which tries to circumvent the intellectual world. For Sohrawardi, the attainment of illumination goes through the world of the mind also. So Sohrawardi says, in order to reach the world of lights, which is the goal of human life, there is no other path except knowledge. All other paths of service, of devotion, of worship, are in order to enable us to receive illumination. This is his central thesis. And because knowledge is being, it's through illumination that our being is intensified. That is, in the deepest sense, we are what we know, and we know what we are. There's a correspondence between the two. Now, usually we think of ourselves as being this and this. We are tired, we are happy, we are strong, we are knowledgeable, we are ignorant. And an adjective follows the verb to be. And we make all these comparisons. But in the deepest sense, to be itself has a comparative form. That is, there are people who are more than others, who are not this or that more than others, but who are more than others. This is at first very difficult for us to understand. And perfection comes with the increase in the intensity of the light of our being. 
Since God is being absolutely, the more we are, the more are we close to God. Now this also solves the question of God's knowledge of particulars, because his knowledge of a thing is its being. It's not that a particular thing is out there and the question is how God knows it. That's posing the wrong question. So Surawardi reconstructs peripatetic philosophy on the basis of this doctrine of illumination, the significance of knowledge as transforming our being, that all knowledge is ultimately a form of illumination, and that the goal of human beings is to ascend vertically. And Surawardi considered the path that he was following to be a combination of the perfection of both discursive philosophy and tasted philosophy, which is illumination. And the combination of the two was the perfection of the philosophical quest. Finally, the reference point for later Islamic philosophy's interest in mysticism was the tradition of doctrinal or philosophical mysticism or Sufism, particularly as it was explicated by the school of Ibn Arabi, who lived from approximately the middle of the 12th to 13th centuries. His contribution was so monumental that it influenced every expression of speculative mysticism in Islam that came after it. This work and that of his school remained the dominant expression of doctrinal Sufism in Islam. Ibn Arabi was the prolific author of several hundred works on practically every subject, ranging from metaphysics to cosmology to law and hadith. His most significant works are the Magisterial Futuhat al makiya an encyclopedia of the religious and spiritual sciences of Islam, and the Fasus al-Hikam, a masterly summary of his metaphysics based on his distinctive prophetology. All of Ibn Arabi's work is steeped in the Quran and Hadith, so much so that it can be seen as a sophisticated spiritual commentary on these texts. Subsequent Islamic philosophers worked to synthesize these intellectual perspectives, particularly after Nasir al-Din Tusi revived Ibn Sina's philosophy in the East in the 13th century. Ibn Turqa Isfahani, for example, was a prominent philosoph from the 14th to early 15th centuries, who is at once an Ashraqi, a Mashai, and a master of the school of Ibn Arabi. Such figures therefore set the stage for a grand synthesis in Islamic philosophy. This concludes our discussion of Ishraqi philosophy and the initial attempts at rapprochement between various schools of Islamic thought. In the next segments, we'll turn to the grand synthesis of Mullah Sadra and his teacher, Mir Damad.